be in there. We don't need to record this part. Okay. <clears throat> so how did the signing go today? Went very well. It was a lot of fun. Um, oh, good. A lot of folks came by, a lot of friends I haven't seen in a long time. So that, that was very gratifying. Um, and uh, sold quite a few books, which was, uh, you know, uh, doing a book tour during a pandemic, I figure if I sell one book per stop, <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> To, to sell any more than that is is just gravy so yeah oh great um did you leave us any signed copies i did oh mm -hmm. good 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 signed okay. however however much stock you had left okay Tommy, I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. I, I read your work in The Observer for years. Uh, my family moved to Charlotte while I was in college at Wake Forest, and I have this oddly specific uh, visual image as a memory of, of coming home, whether for you know uh, fall break or the holidays or for the summer, and uh, walking into the house and, and there being a copy of the Charlotte Observer on the kitchen table as the afternoon light was coming in the window. And uh, it's, just, it's just one of those things when I think about home, I, I tend to think about that, that, that picture in my mind, so. Oh, that's nice, that's nice. It's, uh, it's funny how people have that relationship with the paper. Some yeah. friends of ours had a daughter when she was a little, little girl. Um, they went to somebody else's house and she picked up the paper and saw my picture in it. That's when I was mm -hmm. a columnist for the paper. And she got all upset because she thought I was only in their paper, oh, like yeah. only in their copy, you know, yeah. she's like he's in the other copies too. That what fun is that? So <laughs> my, my other memory of the observer, if we have time to indulge in it was um, when I was growing up, my grandparents lived in Lincoln County and they had the old uh, Charlotte Observer box underneath their oh, yeah. mailbox, which we didn't have in Winston-Salem. The Winston-Salem Journal didn't, didn't do those. And so I always thought that was so fancy to have, you know, the newspaper had its very own box to be put in, instead of just being tossed into the yard like ours was. How y'all big city folks did it in down in Charles. It, it classes up the joint, right? All right, exactly. We'll give it just another minute or so for people to jump on. Feel free to put your comments, your chats for Ed in the chat box. I know he will want to hear from all of you guys. Maybe not all of you. I, I don't know who else here. <laughs> I see a couple Southerns, so. Your, your oh, nemesis. Definitely not <laughs> yeah. them. No, not them. Everybody else. Right. Okay, so we will get started. Um, let me get my bio so I can read. Um, I am Hallie Gomez. I'm the events coordinator at Park Road Books, and I am thrilled to have um, Ed Southern talking about his book, Fight Songs, with Tommy Tomlinson. Um, so how tonight will work, um, Ed and Tommy will have a discussion and talk about um, the book and writing and whatever Whatever questions Tommy wants to throw at it, he must answer. <laughs> so um, 
during the during the conversation, feel free to add any comments in the chat. Um, if you look on the bottom of your screen, there should also be a Q&A. If you have questions, feel free to put the your questions in there. Um, and at about 7.45 or so, we will um, I'll jump back on and we'll take questions that you put in there. So um, you have the whole time to do that. Um, just a couple things that um, I need to go over, just kind of policy rules and policies before we officially get started. Um, so, well, number one, um, Ed's book, Fight Songs, he was, I know it's kind of backwards, um, he was at the store today and he signed a lot of copies and we have more at the store for you. So if you did not already get your copy, give us a call, check our website or come see us. We have autographed copies. Um, also, um, the last thing that the kind of rules that I wanna go over, um, I wanna remind you that Parker Books has a zero tolerance policy in regard to harassment. By attending our virtual event, you agree to our code of conduct and anyone violating this rules will be expelled from this event and all future events at the discretion of the organizers. I know that's not gonna be a problem in this case, but um, I feel I have to mention that anyway. Um, now let's get to the good stuff. So I am gonna introduce Ed Southern and Tommy Tomlinson and then I will let them take it away. So Ed, a native North Carolinian, he had, he's been the executive director of the North Carolina Writers Network since 2008. He is the author of four books, including the short story collection, Perlis Angels. His shorter work in a variety of genres has appeared in Story South, the North Carolina Literary Review, The Dirty Spoon, the North Carolina 10 by 10 Play Festival, South Writ Large, the Asheville Poetry Review, and elsewhere. In 2015, he received the Fortner Award for Service to the Literary Arts in North Carolina. He lives in Winston-Salem. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Tommy Tomlinson has written for publications, including Esquire, ESPN the Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Forbes, Garden and Gun, and many others. He spent 23 years as a reporter and local columnist for the Charlotte Observer, where he was a finalist for the 2005 Pulitzer Prize in commentary. His stories have been chosen twice for the Best American Sports Writing Series, and he also appears in the anthology America's Best Newspaper Writing. He is also the host of the podcast Southbound in partnership with the WFAE Charlotte's NPR station. He has taught at Wake Forest University, the University of Georgia, and at workshops and conferences across the country. Tommy and his wife, Alex Felsing live in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Elephant in the Room is his first book. I will let Ed and Tommy take it away. Thank you, Hallie. I appreciate that. And I appreciate it for all of you who came out. I'm sure uh, many of you, like me, are tired of being on Zoom. But um, I'm also pretty grateful for it, to be, thank uh, to be honest, because it allows even in these strange times, us together um, around the, the virtual fireplace in one way or another and, and have some conversation. So, and I'm really looking forward to this. I wanted to start by talking about the scope of your book. Um, you cover a lot of territory in this book and I know that it sort of didn't intend to be that way. And so could you just start by talking a little bit about the idea you had at the at the beginning of fight songs and sort of how it changed over time. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you to, to Park Road Books for, for having me in the store this afternoon, having me on live today. Thank you, Tommy, uh, for this conversation. Um, I, I also want to thank uh, Sarah Mori Creech of the English Department at Queens University, who have loaned me the use of, uh, of an office this evening uh, to have this virtual conversation. So, um, at first, what became the book Fight Songs was going to be a short, lighthearted, I hoped funny little essay um, exploring the weirdness of being a lifelong Wake Forest football fan 
married to an Alabama football fan during the decade of Nick Saban's dominance when the Crimson Tide became the Crimson Dementor of college football. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't football fans, aren't familiar with with kind of the the the, the hierarchy of college football. Um, Wake Forest, despite some remarkable success in the last few years, is still sort of everyone's go-to shorthand for a program that no one cares about. We Wake Forest is by far the smallest school in the Power Five conferences, and I think still uh, all time has has the losingest record in the Power Five. Um, if any of you are, are classic rock fans, you may know the old Steely, Steely Dan song, Call Me Deacon Blues, whose chorus is, they have a name for the winners in the world, I want a name when I lose. They call Alabama the Crimson Tide, call me Deacon Blues. And as I write about in the book, it turns out they, they weren't even aware of Wake Forest when they write that, it's just a coincidence, <laughs> which somehow is even more of a Wake Forest football situation than if they had been intentionally insulting us. Um, so I started to do that and began to ask questions about, well, how did it get this way? How did it get so, to where, you know, the state of Alabama shuts down for the Iron Bowl, the annual game between Auburn and Alabama, uh, whereas North Carolina used to shut down for quarterfinal Friday of the ACC men's basketball tournament, but doesn't anymore. And why is there a difference both in the sport and the season, but also a difference in the verb tense, you know, that, that Alabama still has this tradition of coming to a standstill for the Iron Bowl. ACC tournament doesn't even have quarterfinal Friday anymore. You know, what happened and what does that mean for, for those of us who live here? While I was working on that um, and, and had been talked into expanding, you know, my original essay into a book link manuscript, 2020 came along and some of the questions about our history and our, our cultural identity that I was looking at sort of um, came roaring to the forefront in, in a lot of the issues that we were facing last year in terms of public health, in terms of attitudes towards government, uh, and then, you know, with the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, of, of the summer, of course, with, with questions of race. So the book, you know, I, I had to stop what I was doing and, and completely refocus the book, um, refocus the narrative. And the end result is, is the book that came out last week. So there's a lot of threads to pull on there. there. And, um, the first one I want to pull on is sort of the, um, that, that football thread, especially college football, which, um, the South uh, has dominated for years now. But as you point out in the book, um, we in the South kind of came late to college football, even though it has come to mean, uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned in the book, the SEC has this slogan, it just means more. And that's pretty accurate, I think. How did the South come to this so late? Why did that happen? And, and why do you think it matters so much now? Oh boy, um, well, it came to South late because, um, you know, what we now think of as college football was, was more or less, uh, it's not entirely accurate to say it was invented. It kind of developed in the years following the Civil War and it began in, in the Northeast. Um, you know, just last year we celebrated, uh, was the, no, excuse me, two years ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the game between Rutgers and Princeton that is generally seen as the first college football game, even though to us it would have looked a lot more like a soccer game. Um, you know, it, it stayed in the Northeast and very slowly trickled out to the rest of the country. Didn't really start getting into the South until the 1880s. And that was because the South was still uh, to a great degree uh, isolated culturally and economically um, following re reconstruction. Um, some of that was the South's own doing. Um, but eventually it did get down here and, and was, was taken up fairly quickly, um, first by colleges and, and later by, you know, in, in, when, when they started uh, this newfangled idea called public schools, you know, they began to field football teams. And 
by the time it arrived in the South, the game of football had, had already had ascribed to it these, these uh, meanings steeped in uh, masculinity and martial virtues. Um, you know, it was played, again, it started in 1869, was the Princeton-Rutgers game. So you're four years removed from the end of the Civil War. Many of the first players uh, were younger brothers of Civil War veterans, later sons of Civil War veterans. And there was this feeling that they needed to prove themselves as the men who'd gone before them had. There also was this, uh, what uh, Professor Andrew Doyle of, of Winthrop University um, who was nice enough to talk to me about the book, there was going on what he described as a crisis of masculinity because with increasing industrialization and commercialization, you had more and more men working outside the home for the first time and, and leaving their sons at home with their mothers. And so they were, well, how are we going to teach our boys how to be real men? And football became their answer, their way to do that, rightly or wrongly. So when this sport that is already seen as, you know, a preparation, if not a substitute for war and an expression of masculinity comes to a South whose colleges are populated by the sons of the elite, you know, the, these are the, are the sons, you know, of, of people who could afford to send their children to college. And And they're still smarting from the loss of the Civil War. And this, this sport arrives with these ready-made meanings. Of course, they embraced it. Um, you know, not just to refight the Civil War, as is, you know, that's called kind of the, the, the cliched answer. Um, and, and it's cliched because it's not wrong. But also because there was this, you know, uh, long before the Civil War, the South had this, this culture, this tradition of, of mm. honor and shame of dominance established through demonstrative play of, um, you know, uh, what w, W.J. Cash called, you know, the, the, chip, the, the chip on the shoulder brag of a boy um, where, you know, any slight had to be answered. Um, you know, it, it was like football had, had been ready-made for all of these, these complex cultural issues that the South had brewing. And so they grabbed onto it and then eventually became really good at it and then continued being really good at it. And so you, you, you know, a hundred years later, 150 years later, you end up with, it just means more. There's nothing just about it. There's centuries worth of history that make it mean more. Another part of that, that I had not thought about much until I read this book, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that football has all these sort of war metaphors and, and the, the sport itself is, is, Got sort of based on violence. There's no other sport really where to, your job is to knock somebody else down. But the thing that I had not thought about much until you brought it up was how much it's tied into, it's sort of a game about land. You know, you're, you move into the opponent's territory. And if you think about what a touchdown is, it's when you've claimed all the field for yourself. You know, and then you, you touch down and you start over and try again. And the, and the point is to just kind of, kind of keep claiming more and more turf. And there's, there's no other sport I think of there where that sort of thing is so ingrained in the, in the way the game's played. And, and I think you, you tie that in some ways to the, the people who, who settled here in the South, you know, the, the Europeans who came here. And could you just talk about that a little bit and what, maybe the particulars of the people who came here and what the ideas of like land and property meant to them? Sure. I mean, yeah, as, as I say in the book, you know, football is a game of, of land, of territory that is literally measured and marked and, and chained. You know, I mean, you have you have chain gang on the sideline that, that you know, measures a first down. Um, and I, I had never really thought about it in those terms until, uh, and I noticed my brother among the panelists, I have to give him a shout out, he and, and some of, uh, of our friends got me started watching soccer, um, which I, I didn't really care about until I was an adult, and noticed what a fluid game it is. I mean, we're, you know, you're trying to move the ball towards the opponent's goal, but you're not, you're not claiming territory 
as you go the way that you are in football. Um, and so that really got me to thinking about, you know, the, the South in particular. I mean, I mean, the United States as a whole does. I don't think this is by no means unique to the South uh, of, you know, you, you make your way by, by claiming your land. Um, but in the South, unlike in the Northeast, it was up until really the 1950s, if not even a little bit later, a, 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 an almost purely agricultural economy. Um, and, you know, certainly in the antebellum era, the, the only way for uh, a, a man to gain status in society was to own land. You know, you had to be a landowner. Of course, in the early days of the Republic, you had to be a landowner to vote. Um, and so, you know, the, there already was, again, this, this cultural preoccupation with, you know, grabbing territory with grabbing land um, through whatever means necessary. And again, along comes a game like what American football had evolved into by the time it came south, where it's no longer the fluid back and forth game that soccer and rugby are. You know, it's a game of, of marching down the field, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust, 10 yards in a first down at a time. And, and again, it just, it was, uh, it was almost tailor-made for, for the concerns, the cultural concerns of the south. And you also got to draw a distinction between, you know, I know that uh, we always talk about, at least among white Southerners, the sort of Scotch-Irish strain that, you know, the born fighters, you know, and that sort of thing. But you talk about how, you know, there are also uh, other people here or other people who came over here and settled, including, it sounds like, some of your people. Could you talk about that a little bit and, and those distinctions? Sure. Um, you know, of course, the, the first white settlers in what became the American South uh, landed at uh, um, Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. And, um, you know, we're, we're followed by successive waves of, of settlers um, establishing, a, a, you know, a, a recognizable culture in the tidewater of Virginia um, along the James and York rivers, and then, you know, moving a little bit inland, a little bit north, a little bit south in North Carolina. Um, in the late 1600s, you had uh, the settlement of the South Carolina Low Country, the European settlement, excuse me, of the South Carolina Low Country. Um, and again, establishing this sort of tidewater um, aristocracy. You know, they were at first tobacco planters in the Virginia tidewater. They were rice planters in the South Carolina Low Country. But it, it, but it was a very similar they shared a very similar culture. And again, you had that, um, you know, establishment of, of demonstrative play as a, as a marker of dominance, you know, in the Tidewater, Virginia, they love to race horses, you know, to show, and, and that, you know, it was like the horses were their avatars to show their, their strength and their speed and their prowess. Um, and then, you know, well, that culture is fairly well established and you have, um, settlers, European settlers starting to come into what was then the back country, into what we now call the Piedmont, and of course the mountains eventually. Um, those tend to be all, all tend to be lumped together now as Scots-Irish. Um, and, and, you know, I read a lot of historians who argue that they were the dominant cultural group of the back country. But, but even at the time, you know, they would say, we are a mixed people. They were not a single ethnic group. It was more a cultural group based around the, the, the shifting often violent borders um, around the North Sea in, you know, the North of England, Lowland Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, Wales, uh, parts of Northern Germany, and uh, even Holland. You know, they, they all contributed settlers to, to the American backcountry and, and brought with them this, this heritage of, of insecurity and in many cases of, of, of great poverty. And so here again, they saw in this land um, an opportunity to, to get a toehold for themselves and to achieve some sort of, of status and what they hoped would be security. And most of them, not all, but most of them were perfectly willing to ignore the fact that there already were people 
upon this land. You know, there, there were people who, who uh, were living their lives in, in the South. And the same thing goes for the Tidewater settlers. I, I didn't mean to exclude them from that by any means. Um, you know, and, and so again, you, you get this, this cultural tradition of, of being quick to violence, of, of, you know, seeing violence as a natural recourse to most uh, disputes. There's a, and it's apocryphal, no one, no one knows if she really said it, but supposedly Andrew Jackson's mother said to him before she uh, went away for what turned out to be the last time and died, that, um, uh, you know, no, never bring suit for uh, slander or something else, uh, because those are affairs of honor, and you need to settle those yourself. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it, it, literally his, his mama told him, you know, if someone slanders you, you know, you deal with that yourself. You don't, you don't have recourse to the courts or any kind of civilized process. So it was, again, it was, it was a, a cultural tradition that, that was ready to embrace this game that, as Thomas Boswell said, you know, the problem with football is not that it's uh, violent, though it is, it's that it presents no successful alternative to violence. Um, that, you also make the distinction, you know, as we go through the book between, you know, different parts of the South and different sections, you know, as, as, as you said at the beginning, you know, and I think most people probably here tonight know, you know, much of the, what we consider the deep South, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, those areas are our football country. Other parts of the South, especially North Carolina, are considered basketball country. What, one thing I didn't know before I read your book is that the Atlantic Coast Conference, ACC, you know, the pinnacle of, of college basketball started out as a football conference. And I, I was wondering if you could sort of describe how that, how and why that happened. And then what shifted to make basketball sort of king here? Well, it's funny because I didn't know that until I started writing this book and, and reading up on it. I, I would have assumed that the ACC had always been a basketball conference. Um, well, well, Try to make this as as concise as I can. Um, the the founding seven schools of the ACC all had been members of the the Southern Conference, um, which had become a, a humongous league, uh, stretching from West Virginia University uh, all the way down to the Citadel, um, and it it was becoming unwieldy, and it was marred by uh, uh, well the the biggest uh, football scandal involving the Southern Conference was uh, the reigning conference champion, William and Mary, was found to have altered the grades of some of its football recruits. And um, when the, the president of the school brought this before the, uh, they don't call it the Board of Trustees, I think they call it the Board of Visitors, they said, well, so what? And wanted to get rid of the president, not the football coach. Um, and well, so that sounds, had, that sounds know, familiar. Right, except it, William and Mary, you know, that, that's the strange part of it. Um, and in fact, uh, right before the ACC was founded, uh, the conference champion in football, the Southern Conference was Washington and Lee, you know, which is division three now. And um, in response to this, several of, of the leaders of the Southern Conference wanted to scale back football. And they, in fact, imposed a bowl ban. They said, okay, none of our member schools are going are gonna to accept uh, invitations to play in bowl games which even then was worth a, a lot of money, not the money it's worth now, but a lot of money. And um, two of the schools in particular, Clemson and the University of Maryland, had really uh, built themselves using football as a way to attract interest, attract fans, attract booster donations. And so um, Curly Bird at Maryland, Frank Howard at Clemson said, no, we're, somebody invites us to a bowl, we're going. And if you don't like it, kick us out. So the two of them and, and the University of South Carolina were fed up with the Southern Conference. Meanwhile, the big four in North Carolina of Wake Forest, Duke, Carolina, and State um, were very worried about the lack of, what we would call now the lack of institutional control, the lack of academic control um, caused by being in such a, a huge conference, you know, with those, uh, you know, football factories like William and Mary and Washington and Lee involved. Um, so they wanted to, they thought maybe we should leave the Southern Conference, South Carolina Conference, 
they end up working, coming together with Clemson, Maryland, and South Carolina. They meet in Greensboro, 1953, formally withdraw from the Southern Conference, decide to set up a new conference, call it the Atlantic Coast. Um, you know, football was their main concern. Basketball was an afterthought, even though college basketball was already becoming more popular thanks to NC State hiring Everett Case uh, to take over its basketball program in the 1940s. And, um, you know, he began the Dixie Classic Tournament, which became hugely popular and, and you know, a, a kind of an obsession uh, in the state. And in response to Case's dominance, the other schools started amping up their basketball programs. Uh, UNC went out and hired Frank McGuire away from St. John's. Um, Duke uh, uh, tried to hire, came very close to hiring Red Auerbach. Um, uh, didn't get him, but got, um, I believe, Harold, I'm blanking on the name. I think it was Harold Bradley instead, uh, who hired Vic Bubis as an assistant. Wake Forest already had a good basketball coach in Murray Greeson. He hired an assistant uh, who had played for Red Auerbach on the Celtics named Bones McKinney. And so you have the big four basketball teams getting better and better and better. Um, the, the, the event that's credited with really, you know, not doing it overnight, but turning the ACC into a basketball league was Carolina winning the 1957 national championship. Um, because not only did they win the national championship at a time when, you know, uh, uh, the South was rarely number one in anything that you wanted to be proud of, but they won it in two straight triple overtime thrillers. And they won it in two straight televised triple overtime thrillers. Uh, thanks to the vision of C.D. Chesley, um, who, you know, had been working in television broadcasting, which was a, 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 an infant medium at the time, had the foresight, I think, you know, people would want to watch these games, um, made a deal to broadcast the games uh, through stations in, it was just three markets, I think it was Greensboro, Charlotte, and Wil uh, no, excuse me, Raleigh, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Wilmington, and then that was the semifinal, and then for the final, he added two more. Um, and so North Carolinians got, got to watch the University of North Carolina, you know, win two classic games to win a national championship. And at that point, you know, you could say, you know, the die, the die was cast that, and especially since you know, the ACC kept not winning as much in football, gradually, you know, over the course of the next few years, North Carolina becomes a college basketball state. That becomes the sport that we set our seasons by. I want to drag all this into the present now. Okay. Um, all this history that that you've you've talked about. Now we're we're in a place where um, this is, I'm sure, true outside the South as well, but certainly in the South, the chances are very good that the highest paid state employee uh, in football states is going to be the football coach at the state university in North Carolina, maybe the basketball coach uh, somewhere. These schools have become, as you kind of talk about a lot in your book, they've become not just universities, but they've become brands. Um, and in fact, the players starting this year who can get uh, money for their name and likeness, the players themselves have sort of become brands. And it's become this huge business where the TV contracts are like the GDP of small countries. And at the same time, it's rooted in very ordinary stuff like your family and my family and so many millions of other families watching on tv together people who may never go to a game uh who, who may never spend money on on all this incredible cornucopia of sports and i guess i'm wondering kind of what your ambivalence level is about all this i know everybody who who cares about college sports who follows it has some level of ambivalence about what it's become and, and the bigness of it while still loving it. Where, where are you on that scale these days? Through the roof. Um, I, I mean, I, I really, I mean, it really is something that I grapple with um, on all sorts of fronts. You know, my, my love for college sports and especially college football with, um, the the uh, inequities that it 
creates or encourages um, or, or sometimes uh, disguises, um, you know, as, aside from, you know, the, the, the physical damage that's done to so many of the players, you know, that ended up, you know, it's funny, you know, before last year, when we talked about, you know, playing safely, you meant, you meant head injuries, you know, how do, how do you, how can you play while avoiding uh, concussion? Um, you know, then last year, it's how do you play safely while uh, avoiding COVID? Um, and it really, you know, the, the ambivalence is the right word because, you know, while there are an awful lot of bad things about college sports and particularly uh, college football and, and men's basketball, there are a lot of great things about them too. I mean, and, and you, can't, you can't deny one or the other. You know, you just have to kind of find a balance. I think uh, the name, image, and likeness rules help, at least it helps me a great deal because you talk about, you know, the players themselves becoming brands. Players have been brands for a long, long time now. You know, in the book, I talk about, you know, God only knows how many uh, Tua Tungavailoa jerseys were sold in the state of Alabama. Um, you know, and he never saw a dime from any of them. You know, I, I could go out and, and print you know, well, Bryce Young is is the Alabama quarterback. Now I could go down to a screen printing store and print up, you know, 50 t-shirts with Bryce Young's, you know, name, image, likeness, number, and go stand on a street corner in Tuscaloosa on game day and, and make a nice chunk of change selling those. Um, Bryce Young himself can't do the same or couldn't do the same thing until finally now we're, we're going to let these players um, get just a very small taste of the, you know, like you say, you know, the, the multi-billion dollar uh, industry and economy that is college sports. A big part of this book, uh, of course, is, is sort of a love story of how you met and married your wife who, uh, you know, and, and you're sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum, especially when it comes to football, as you said, Wake may have the worst record of any you know, major college football team Historic. around. Yeah. And, uh, and Alabama, I'm not sure if they have the best record, but they certainly are the preeminent college football team and have been for, for decades. The question I want to ask is, do you think that you and your wife sort of see the world differently in other ways because she grew up rooting for this team that won all the time and you grew up rooting for this team that lost all the time? We certainly see the world in in some different ways, um, and and I can't say for certain that it was caused by, you know, her growing up an Alabama fan, where you have this uh, uh, tradition of victory, um, and this expectation that you know it, it, we're going to have the best team in the country, and if we don't, something's gone wrong and needs to be fixed as opposed to me, you know, uh, um, growing up seeing Wake Forest go through an entire season winning one game. Um, you know, I, I think she tends to see challenges where I tend to see threats. And, you know, it, it gets a similar reaction, but it comes from very different places. Um, Although that may be because she's a younger child and I'm an oldest child, uh, ra rather than our, our difference in rooting interests. But um, what I'm really curious about, and and maybe in another uh, ten years I'll, I'll need to write a second edition and and grapple with this, is that there is at least a generation or two of Wake Forest fans younger than I am that have come of age watching Wake Forest football in the Jim Grobe and Dave Clawson eras when Wake Forest actually won more often than it lost. And they had some down years, but nothing like, you know, the one win seasons of my youth. And, and you know, they approach Wake Forest football with this attitude that I think is called confidence. Um, <laughs> I'm not familiar with it myself, but that's my understanding at least. But I would be curious to see, you know, and knock on wood, if, if, if you know, Coach Clawson continues to have the success that he's had, you know, it, it, 
is that going to have a different effect on, you know, the kids who grow up Wake Forest fans than, than uh, the 70s and 80s did on me? I want to ask one more question and then we'll turn it over for, for any of the audience members who want to ask questions. Um, one of the quotes you mentioned in, in the book is something quote that I love from the moment I heard it. Uh, it. It was kind of in the middle of COVID, this relief pitcher for the Washington Nationals, Sean Doolittle, uh, somebody asked him about COVID and how its relationship to sports. And he said, sports are the reward for a functioning society. Mm -hmm. And the question I want to ask out of that is, do you think we're a functioning society right now? And, and I guess kind of the bigger question is, do we deserve to have sports right now because of the way we're acting in the rest of our society? Oh, boy. You know, uh, uh, I drove over here from, from Park Road Shopping Center um, to get ready for this, and everybody obeyed all the traffic lights that we came to. And so I, I guess I have to say that we are still a functioning society. Are we functioning well? I, I, I don't see how we can make that argument, um, and certainly not functioning as well as a nation with the resources of the United States ought to be. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna tell a quick story and, and it's fairly personal, but it's just, it's just powerful. And I, I hope y'all don't mind that, um, you know, I have a daughter in kindergarten and um, her second week in school, uh, there was a school shooting at the high school less than a mile from her elementary school. And so her school handled it beautifully as, as that's the wrong word to describe the situation but they handled it as well as as could be asked for and they went into lockdown and they um the principal came over the intercom and said you know we're, we're asking everyone to stay in their classrooms we're going to lock the doors in order to keep you safe well there just happened to be thunderstorms rolling through uh our town that afternoon and so our daughter came home with the assumption that oh they locked the doors to keep us safe from the thunderstorms and then last week, um, we're, we're getting her ready to go off to school, and we tell her, Here, you need to take your jacket because it's supposed to rain this afternoon. And she rolls her eyes and says, great, they're going to lock the doors again. And, you know, it was, it was funny, and it was heartbreaking, and it was so, so sad that, you know, she's four weeks into kindergarten, and this is something that she's already having to deal with. And so, again, I don't know that you can say that we are a well-functioning society when we can tell stories like that one. Do we deserve sports is, I mean, I guess in order to not be a hypocrite, I have to say that we do because I've been watching sports. And, it, it, it's, you know, again, I'm, I'm a, a, a lukewarm soccer fan at best and have come to it fairly recently. But when the Bundesliga started playing on TV last what was it, April, and they were the first sport back on TV, you better believe I was in front of my screen. Um, and, and so, you know, you know, I guess if I say we don't deserve sports, you know, I'm a hypocrite. I, I don't know that we ought to let sports consume us as much as we have. And, and I wrote in the book, and, and, and I, I sometimes think, you know, again, maybe the second edition, I'll elaborate on this, that I found myself much less, uh, I didn't follow, you know, even though uh, the ACC played sort of almost a full schedule of games last season, I, I found myself not following them as much. You know, I, I, I listened and watched a lot of Braves game, Atlanta Braves games, but I wasn't really following the standings. I found myself not caring as much about the overall picture, the overall arc. And I think it was because I had other things to worry about, um, you know, and, and, and I almost feel like sports was in a, a, a healthier place in my own psyche, um, while the rest of my psyche was completely falling apart. Uh, at least I had sports, you know, in a good place uh, for that time period. So I, I don't, it's, it's a really hard question to answer. Well, you're talking to somebody who, you know, it's been 
pretty worried about COVID for a year and a half now and still went to the Georgia Clemson game last weekend. So in, in, a, in a crowd of 74,000 people. So uh, hypocrisy, uh, yeah. it works on, on all ends there. I do have one more thing I wanted to, to ask about that is that part of the discussion sort of brought up and that's this idea of, of fearfulness. And you, you talk about how football especially, but I think sports in general, uh, are built around this idea of toughness and resilience. I and mean, in football, certainly the expression of that sort of through violence and the idea of it being, you know, a fear, a sport for fearless people. And you talk about sort of the culture of the South and how a lot of that may actually be built from the opposite. I think the way you put it is, what if it's all about being afraid? And could you explain that a little bit? I, I can try to. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, when, when you look at the history of the South and you look at these people who were so quick to violence, so prone to violence, um, secure people don't do that. At, at least, you know, and, and I'm conflating, you know, historical reading with my own experience, and, and that's a dangerous thing to do. But just in my experience, you know, in, in my life, one thing I've found is, is that, you know, the, the people who are, are prone to violence, who are quick to violence, are, are oftentimes the people who, who have some sort of deep-seated fear inside them. Um, and and I, will, I will include myself in that, you know, at, at, at times in my life. Um, and when you look at the history of the South and, and you look at the history of, you know, the county militias that were formed in large part to fight the indigenous people in, in order, you know, to, to grab or defend a land grab um, or were in place to prevent uh, an uprising of the enslaved. Um, and you read the historical records of, you know, the governor of the Mississippi Territory saying that, um, you know, you, you must be prepared for a, 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 an insurrection of the enslaved at all times. You must always be on your guard for it. You must always be ready for that. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear mixed up in Southern history. Um, it was, you know, there, there's a movement afoot, and I'm, I'm glad to see it, of instead of calling them plantations, calling them forced labor camps, um, which, which is more accurate, more what they were. Um, and, you know, if, if you look at it through that lens, you know, by some definitions, the entire American South was, you know, one huge carceral state, you know, where whether you were among the gilded few who, who owned slaves or not, you were expected to be willing and able to lend your force to keep this system in place in, in all its injustice and cruelty and barbarism. And so I just, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a historian, and so I can't and wouldn't presume to prove some sort of definitive connection, but it just seems inescapable to me that you know, that's part of the heritage that played into our embrace of a, a sport like football. That's really good. You, I think you did explain it well. Um, I, let's, I'm going to stop right here briefly. I, I have a million questions I could ask, but um, I wanted to see if Hallie had anything from anybody or any, anybody wanted to jump in. Hello. Um, I do have a really great question. Um, anybody else who wants to ask questions, put it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, this, this question, um, it's from an anonymous person, but um, I'm asking for myself also because I'm very interested. Okay, so the question is, you said this book began as an essay and, it, and expanded as, <clears throat> excuse me, and expanded as the pandemic arrived. What was the editorial process like, given that COVID was evolving and changing so much while you were writing? Uh, in a word, fraught. <laughs> um, and, and I noticed that, that my editor, Robin Miura, is in fact among, among the, the attendees tonight. And um, I, I was telling a friend of mine uh, this afternoon that 
this was the first time in my writing life that I've, I've needed my editor to perform the, the psychiatrist function that so many of them do. Um, she talked me down off of a couple of ledges and uh, gave me the kick in the pants that I needed from time to time. Um, we, we had decided to uh, expand the essay into a book before the pandemic hit. Um, Robin, uh, in addition to being the editor in chief at Blair, uh, is also one of the editors of a, a wonderful online magazine called South Writ Large. And I had brought this essay uh, to her to say, you know, do you think you'd be interested? And she said, it's way too long uh, for us to publish, but would you be interested in expanding it into a book? And, and I at first didn't believe that it, there was enough there um, for it to become a book. And, and she was the one who convinced me um, sitting in a sports bar, having lunch, as a matter of fact, uh, back when we could do things like that. Um, and so I was already well on the way to, to writing a book um, when 2020 hit. And, um, you know, I, I've described this moment before, and, and it, it's one of those moments that seems uh, almost cheesily cinematic, and, and people think I'm making it up, but it, but it really is the truth that um, I think it was in either June or July of 2020 that I was transcribing something that I had written longhand and was sitting typing and, you know, of course, had been paying attention to the news, to everything going on uh, in the nation. And as I'm typing up, you know, whatever the passage was, my fingers just sort of gradually started slowing on the keyboard and then eventually came to a stop. And I took a deep breath and I called Robin and said, I can't write this book the way I planned to, can I? And she said, no, you, you can't. You know, the world has changed too much. Um, you, you can't write this, you know, fun, fun little book about sports while, especially while so many college athletes, college football players, college football stars are, you know, putting themselves on the front lines, leading Black Lives Matter rallies, Black Lives Matter marches um, through their communities, you know, being out in the forefront to, to, you know, try to get some kind of change to happen. You know, I, I write about in the book, you know, Darian Wrencher and Trevor Lawrence at Clemson, you know, organizing a Black Lives Matter uh, march through the streets of Clemson, South Carolina. The corpse of John C. Calhoun must have been spinning in its grave. Um, you know, with them doing things like that, um, you know, I, I couldn't approach the subject the way I had planned to. So I just, you know, I, I, I didn't I didn't rewrite the book. I didn't throw out everything I'd done but I did refocus it and I did, you know, re reframe it in terms of how I told this story. Let me just jump in here and, and ask kind of a, a related question. Obviously COVID changed what you're writing about. How did it change your like your writing days? Like how is it different now, especially with a small child, I guess, how, how is your writing life sort of day-to-day -day different than it was maybe before all this? I'm, um, to be perfectly honest, I feel uh, a little bit guilty, a little bit like a cheat. I, I have worked from home since 2008. Um, when I started working for the North Carolina Writers Network, we uh, that year closed up our longtime headquarters and moved into home offices. So I, you know, that Monday that everybody else in the world was adjusting and trying to think, you know, how, how are we going to work from home? You know, at, at least as far as that went, it was just Monday for me. Um, and I, I, you know, did not have to change my, my longtime writing routine. I, I get up very early and try to get up at least a couple of hours ahead of everyone else in my household and, and get writing done then. Um, and I, I hesitate to say this because, because it could be taken the wrong way. In, in one way, it, it helped the completion of this book because we weren't taking any vacations anywhere. Um, and so, you know, I was able to take some time and just, you know, go off by myself. Um, and, and, you know, friends were, were kind enough to, to loan me places to stay for a few days and, and just take the time to do nothing but write, do nothing but work on this book. And so, you know, uh, time that I might've, wasted relaxing at the beach or 
you know, fishing at a lake or something like that. Instead, I, I spent at a desk uh, work, working on what became fight songs. One more kind of more immediate uh, question. So Florida and Alabama play this weekend. Mm -hmm. That's a big game for your wife, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But the one I want to ask you about is uh, Wake Forest hosts Florida State on Saturday. And uh, I know FSU is 0-2. I believe Wake is 2-0. and I'm looking at it right now. Wake Forest, five and a half point favorite over Florida State. What is your, on a one to 10, what is your level of confidence in that outcome? I already told you I'm completely unfamiliar with the concept of confidence as it comes to Wake Forest football, <laughs> um, even after, you know, uh, being there for the Jim Grove and Dave Clawson eras. Um, I would put my confidence at about a three. But part of that is, is um, you know, I'm factoring in my ridiculous levels of superstition when it comes to, to college sports. And, and so, you know, the last thing I would do would be, you know, say, oh, my confidence is an eight or nine. You know, no, no, that, that's jinxing it. One, one of the, the, the weird things about being a Wake Forest fan is that most years, if not every year, the, the, when the media comes out with their preseason ACC polls, they, they almost always pick Wake Forest to finish last or close to last in the ACC Atlantic division. And we get offended. You know, we're, God, you know, are you kidding me? You know, they, they picked Wake Forest to finish last in the Atlantic in 2006 when, when we ended up winning the conference. But then we'll hear, uh, and for some reason, uh, uh, Mark Packer and Wes Durham on their show on the ACC network do this a lot. They'll say things like, um, you know, I think Wake Forest is going to be sneaky good. I think Wake Forest is going to sneak up on a lot of people. I could see them winning seven or eight games, and I'll hear them say that and think, don't you put that hex on us. <laughs> no, no, hush, don't say that, no. Um, you know, so it really is, uh, there, there's just no pleasing the, the longtime Wake Forest fans. I'm, I don't, I don't know. I, we're going to see how this game will, will unfold. The funny part is that I am actually going to be in Alabama for this game. For the Alabama-Florida. But no, I'm not going to be at, at the game. I'm, I'm going to be in Birmingham. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, I've, I've got a signing in Tuscaloosa on Friday, and I'll be staying the weekend with my in-laws in Birmingham. Um, probably, you know, squirreled away in the guest room since I want to watch more of Wake Forest, Florida State than, than Alabama. But um, it'll be, uh, I, I hate not to be there, but uh, it, it, I, I am looking forward to seeing the game. Are those games going to be like at the same time? Yes, exactly the yeah, same Yeah, I was going to say, good, uh, good thing you didn't have to like be in a sports bar in Birmingham having to ask somebody to turn it to the Wake Forest game. Well, you know, I thought it would be funny um, if, if, if Delta hadn't taken over the way it had. I thought it would be funny to have this signing in Tuscaloosa on Friday night, stay, stay in Tuscaloosa for Saturday and go up and down from bar to bar on the strip and just walk in and ask, hey, are y'all showing the Wake Forest Florida State game? <laughs> and, and, and just record the responses that I get and see if anyone actually had their bouncer like physically throw me out just <laughs> for asking. But now with, with the Delta variant, I'm, I'm, I'm not going bar hopping anywhere. Fair, fair enough. Well, it's getting close to eight o'clock. I don't know, Hallie, did you have anything else you wanted to, to add? Or uh, we'll certainly take any more questions if anybody has one. Um, we have no more questions. There's still a, a couple minutes if you want to um, ask questions. I have to say, Tommy, your questions were, were amazing. Um, Thank you. Like, I just, I loved... Um, hearing Ed's answers. So you really guys, you did cover a lot. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we do have Ed's book at Park Road Books, signed copies. We can, um, we do curbside, we can ship them, um, whatever you would like, but definitely you will want your copy if you don't already have one. Um, so Ed and Tommy, if you, do you have anything else that you wanted to to throw in there? Well, Ed, I just wanted to, to make sure people knew, like, I know you're online. I see you on there. How do people find you? 
Um, probably the easiest way is through my website, edsouthern.com. Um, you also can reach me through my publisher, Blair Publishers. Um, their website is blairpub.com. And uh, I'm, I'm on social media, uh, frankly, more than I want to be. So I hope, <laughs> I hope my publishers appreciate that. Um, and, and you can find me on usually on Twitter or Facebook. Yeah, and I'm, I'm the same. I'm on, usually the easiest place to find me is on Twitter at Tommy Tomlinson, and my site is tommytomlinson.com. Uh, thanks to everybody. I'll let Hallie finish it out here, but just for me, thanks to Ed for writing such an interesting book that generated uh, so many thoughtful, uh, so many things for me to think about. Thanks for the great answers to the questions, and Hallie, uh, thanks to you and, and Park Road Books for, uh, for hosting this. Thank you, Hallie, and thank you, Parker Books, and thank you, Tommy. Those, those were fantastic questions. No, thanks. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. It was fantastic. We were happy to host, happy to hear. Um, really, it did give us a lot to think about um, and a lot to read about. So we're going to go read the book. Thank you guys so much, um, and have a great night. Y'all have a good one. Bye. Thank you all.